Put your hands together for God. Oh, man. Isn't God good this morning? I feel somber this morning, and I hate feeling somber in church. I was at a funeral yesterday, and I always say, Scott, if a funeral is more exciting than a Sunday service, we have a problem. And church was more exciting yesterday at the funeral than it is today. We have a problem, Houston. We should come into the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving, into his courts with. If we can celebrate that which is dead and not celebrate a God which is alive, we have a problem. Everyone always gets excited about season, but during this Christmas season, I am so at unease. It's the most annoying time of the season for me. Because if we're really celebrating Christ, this place, should, the roof should be tearing off in this place. How can a funeral be more exciting than a Sunday morning worship for the living God? I, I'm going to behave myself. But it just comes down to the foundational things, Pastor, Pastor Kadeem. And I ask the question every day, do we really have Jesus in here? There's over six billion people that say they follow Christ. Sorry, over two billion people, Talia, that say they follow Christ. Two billion. If two billion of us follow Christ, how come the world is so jacked up? If there's two billion of us that serve Christ, how come this place is so empty? 12 men turn this place upside down to where we can have 2 billion. What are the 2 billion doing? But it's Christmas and we're here to celebrate the living Christ. But a funeral, what happened to my mic? But a funeral was more exciting yesterday than being in church today to self-evaluate ourselves we have to evaluate ourselves brothers and sisters of Christ do we really have Jesus or an ideology of Jesus I can't wait to preach next week I can't wait to preach but my boy is here Pastor Kadeem praise team Pastor Kadeem is here and um, actually before I even get to that before we get to that, um, for all of those that participated, those online that brought stuff in for the hat, mitts, and uh, glove and scarf drive, for those here at MPCC that contributed, oh man, I just thank God so much for you. You guys should give yourselves a hand because yesterday was amazing. Um, I heard, I saw the pictures, a lot of lives were touched. Um, and I, th I think we're going to do more, more of that kind of stuff. I, I, God has brought some things together. I got some connections to do some stuff. And we're going to do more of that. Because I think we do a lot of entertaining ourselves. We talk like we're working, but we're not working. And the word ministry means to serve. The church is a service. We're here to serve people. You all maybe see this. Sit down, sit down. We're here to serve people. So um, where is he? Um, to Alistair, wherever you are, uh, you did an amazing job. It's good to know that as a leader, you can, you can empower other people to lead. Amen? Amen. And Alistair, I'm, I'm proud of you, bro. You did an amazing job. Um, to Winnie um, and John, who put boxes in their, uh, in their offices, went to their boss and asked, to put um, some donation boxes in the offices. Uh, we appreciate you um, for what you did as well. We can put our hands together for that. Um, if there's any religion that Jesus talks about, he says, take care of the widow and the fatherless. That's the only religion we need to have. Other than that, 
It's not needed. But take care of the widow and the fatherless. That's, I'm sorry, I preached your word. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's okay to laugh in church. (laughs) That's that's what's important. Um, This morning, we have our friend from down the street. We could walk to his church if we wanted to. Um, At Salt and Light, um, the assistant pastor, the pastor, Juwan, um, my friend, Pastor Kadeem, um, is going to be speaking with us today. He was the teaching pastor at Surf City, which is in Durham. And then God led him to be the assistant pastor at Salt and Light, the Korean ministry down the street, who's also striving to be a church of all nations. And they're doing well over there in their English ministry. Amen. Um, so he's a gifted teacher. And I wish I told you this before, but we all have smartphones. I got my notepad. So this guy's a gifted teacher, and he's going to be teaching today. Um, I got my notepad. So if you got your, your smartphones, get in your notes, and you know you got a piece of pen and paper, and write some stuff down, because I guarantee you he's going to give you some good stuff. Now, he's the kind of guy that likes to mess around with the Greek and the Hebrew and all that stuff. So um, you guys, just put your hands together. Come on up, Pastor Kadi. Okay. Praise the Lord. Uh, This guy right here who plays the bass, uh, he's like one of my oldest and closest friends, Joe. Uh, I can't look at him too much today because he's going to make me laugh or something stupid like that. But I am grateful to God that I get to be here. Uh, Pastor Q, thank you so much for inviting me um, in like the relatively short time that I've known Pastor Q, he's become like a real big bro to me, you know? So, sir, I appreciate you. I hope I tell you that often enough. If I don't, here I am telling you in front of your church. Um, like Pastor Q said, I'm the, uh, the associate pastor over at Salt and Light. Uh, I'm the teaching pastor over there as well. Um, if you ever get disgruntled with Pastor Q, you can just walk down the street over to us sit through a service, and we will promptly send you right back. Amen? Um, So I'm not actually going to be teaching as deeply as you might think today. I am going to teach a little bit because I can't really help myself. Um, But I just want to speak to you guys about how we as Christians should be dealing with ourselves. How we as Christians should be dealing with ourselves, especially... Um, at this time of year, and especially when we find ourselves in church at this time of year. We're going to just deal with two passages of scripture, and I'm not very deep into suspense, uh, so I like to just tell you what I'm talking about before I get into it. By the time we're done here, we're going to understand how to prioritize, we're going to understand what to do with our allegiance, and we're going to understand the nature of how we enact community. All right? So we are going to learn how to uh, prioritize the kingdom. We're all going to reassess our allegiance to God. And once we've done those two things, we're going to understand how we have to deal with our Christian community. There's so many subtle little nuances in the scripture. Um, Jesus is talking about stuff like uh, love your brother. And in another verse in the same book, he'll say something like love your neighbor. And we think that that's the same thing. It's not the same thing. Those are two completely different things. The way that you love your neighbor and the way that you love your brother are two different things. Why? Because your neighbor is every single human being in the world who's around you. But your brother are the people who you are in church with. Your sister are the people who you are in church with. And Jesus makes it clear that there are two different types of love for these people, both of which emulate the love of God, but to varying degrees. That's not what we're talking about today. But that's what I want to put on the table so that by the time we start uh, understanding how to prioritize God and where our, how to prioritize, prioritize the kingdom and um, sort out our allegiance with God and, and navigate uh, Christian community, we understand what that looks like. Amen? Uh, Let's first turn to Haggai, chapter 1, verse 11. Haggai, chapter 1, verse 11. Sorry, verse 1. Haggai, chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to read Haggai, chapter 1, verse 1. And then I'm going to teach, and then we're going to read 
the rest of this passage of scripture. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Stop. In the second year of King Darius, the second year of King Darius, so that's 521 BC. In 521 BC, all right? So we have to talk about the, the second temple, all right? This is 500 years before Jesus uh, was walking on the earth and ministering. Um, and all of this revolves around the second temple, the temple that Jesus would have grown up in, all right? All of this revolves around that. So we have to talk about the second temple. And in order to do that, we have to talk about the first temple, right? So about 500 years before this, in about 1000 BC, we have a king uh, named Solomon. And Solomon builds a temple known to the ancients as Solomon's Temple. And it was such a glorious temple. He built it the way that the Lord wanted it built. And uh, it looked beautiful. And there was gold and there was silver and all this kind of stuff. But what was extraordinary about the temple is that when the temple was finished being built, the people prayed and Solomon prayed with the people, and the presence of God came down and filled the temple. Right? The presence of God came down and filled the temple. It was probably one of the most supernatural things that had happened in all of history. Because prior to this, they were walking with God in the desert. Prior to being established as a kingdom, they were walking to, with God in the desert. And God made his angel reveal to them, the angel of the Lord, by the physical presence of a pillar of fire during the night and a pillar of cloud during the day. And the Bible says that when Solomon prayed 500 years after that, when he prayed after finished building the temple, that cloud, that pillar of cloud that they walked with by day, it came and it rested inside the temple, inside the innermost place of the temple. So whenever they had to perform sacrifices, they knew not to go into that place because you go in there and you so much as sweat you die. You understand? We're going to make some of that more clear as we go. But you go in there into the presence of God and you so much as sweat, you die. I think my grandmother told me that sweat was a naturally occurring thing and therefore is a representation of sin. That's wild. That's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> but so this verse that we just read in the, in the, in the year of King Darius, 500, in the second year of King Darius, 521 B.C., um, like I said, it takes place 500 years after Solomon built the first temple. So he builds the first temple. They pray. The presence of the Lord is in there. And, and the presence of the Lord is in there. And for about 500 years, the people wrestle back and forth with whether or not they want to serve God. Isn't that crazy? You know that there's something supernatural in there. And you still wrestle back and forth with whether or not you want to serve God. That's why in, 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 in Luke chapter... Um, 19, I think it is, when Jesus is telling the parable of, it might not be Luke 19, God forgive me, but when Jesus is telling the parable of uh, Lazarus and the rich man, in the midst of that parable, the rich man, he says to Abraham, who he sees in the afterlife, he says to him, send Lazarus to talk to my brothers, because I have so many of them, and I don't want them to come to this place. And Abraham responds to him and says, no, they have Moses and the prophets, what we would interpret as they have the Old Testament. Moses said, uh, Abraham said, they have an account and they have a testimony that talks to them and warns them about all these kind of things. So if they won't listen to that, they won't listen when someone comes back from the dead. Come on, man. Two billion Christians, or so we claim. <laughs> like Pastor Hugh said, where are we at? We know, we believe, we at least pretend to align ourselves. But when push comes to shove, where are we at? We can't even show up for church on Sunday mornings. We can't even show up on time when we do show up. It costs us too much energy. We don't tell that to our boss, though. Still not what I'm talking about. Somehow, some way, 70 years before this passage of scripture that we just read, the second year of King Darius, 521 BC, 70 years before that, the Neo-Babylonian Empire uh, 
I'm not going to get into the whole history of it, but they overthrow Judah, or rather they, they sack the kingdom of Judah, where the temple was, the first temple of Solomon, where the presence of God was in this temple. They overthrow, or they, they sack this nation of Judah. They particularly sack Jerusalem, where the temple is, and they destroy the temple. They destroy the temple. Prior to this, there was a prophet who said that he saw in a vision that the presence of God had left the temple because of the people's unwillingness to align themselves with God. So God is already gone. God is already gone. Next phase of history, the Babylonians come in, people who don't know or serve or fear God, they destroy the temple. Now what we're looking at right here is 70 years later. The Babylonians have been overthrown by the um, Achaemenid Empire, led by King Darius II, um, or Darius the Great, actually Darius the Third, who's Darius the Great. So the Achaemenid Empire is in control um, of the ancient world at this moment in time. And Darius is much kinder than the Babylonians were. And when he comes into power, he says to the Jewish people, you want to go back and rebuild your country? Yeah, go ahead. I, I really could not care less. I'm too rich to worry about whatever you want to do. Go ahead. Go back and build your country. And so they go back. And where we find ourselves at this moment in Scripture is where they've entered Jerusalem and they're trying to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay? So I wanted to give you that history that sets the context. They have entered Jerusalem and they're trying to rebuild Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the place where Solomon's temple was, where the presence of God physically was. I'm going to tell you something horrifying before we get to the end of this. Um, but they're trying to rebuild Jerusalem. All right, let's read verse 2. Now, this is the Lord talking through Haggai, the prophet. He says, the Lord of armies says this. These people say the time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to live in paneled houses while this house, referring to the temple, lies in ruins? Now the Lord of armies says this, think carefully about your ways. So what's, before we get into that, what's happening? They're back in Jerusalem. They're back in Judah, God's people. They're back. And they want to rebuild the city. And they have prioritized everything in this entire city, their homes, their schools, their community centers, their shops, their corner stores, their gas stations, whatever you, however you fuel a horse, I don't know. They have prioritized every single thing in this city except the temple. Except the one thing that at its destruction they were sent out of the city and out of the country. They have prioritized everything except the temple. How is that different from how we deal with church? How is that a different thing from how we today deal with church? The Bible says that when, Dave, when David originally wanted to build the temple before God told him, no, you can't do it because you've killed too many people. I know you want to, but you've really killed a lot of people. So I'll let your son Solomon do it. But when David wanted to build the temple and God told him no, he said, well, I at least have to be able to do something. I at least have to be able to put my hands to this work. Or no, better yet, get the resource. So even if I can't put my hands to the, to the work, when my son comes and he puts his hands to the work, he's ready. You understand the Bible says that a good man, not a wise man, not a smart man, but a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, right? So David said, I at least have to be able to provide something. So David gathered all the resources that were available and that were, uh, could be used to, be, to build the temple. Somebody told him, hey, I'm going to give you this for free. David said, no, I won't give to the Lord that which cost me nothing. I won't give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. And we give to the Lord that which costs us nothing. We today in church, we give to the Lord whatever we have. Even when we're talking about giving our 10%, when we're talking about giving our tithes, that's okay because that's in the budget. 
You understand what I mean? I'm not bashing budgeting. We all got to budget. This is Toronto. We don't budget, we're going to die. Right? I'm not bashing budgeting. We got a budget. But when you put something in the budget, you understand that this is what this is for, and then that's it. You just leave that alone. You understand what I mean? When you do that, you don't leave space for offering. You understand what I mean? Keep budgeting, keep paying your tithes, but also consider the fact that maybe there will come a time when somebody in your church needs something, I'm getting ahead of myself, and maybe you can give it to them and it might cost you. Do you do it anyways, or do you just say to yourself, oh, that's gonna get figured out somehow? What we fail to realize, especially in the church, is that we are the somehow. This is our community. This is our way of doing and thinking and being according to what the Lord has given to us. We are the ones who create and who give and navigate the somehow. If you can't do it and you can't do it and I can't do it, maybe you can do it. And if you can do it but you need help, it shouldn't cost me any energy to give you that help, sir. If it does, I have to realign what's going on here. So before I get to that, priorities. God is telling these people that they failed to prioritize him. They failed to prioritize him. Now, that failure is terrible in and of itself, but we haven't finished reading the scripture. The first thing that we have to do, however, is learn how to prioritize the kingdom. We have to have a willingness to give and to sell everything we have. Why am I saying this like this? And why does it sound so extreme? Because in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer and to breaking bread and to fellowship. Skip down a few verses. And they sold all their possessions and gave to the poor among them as any had need. I, 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 I can't even do anything that's going to cost me creamer money. For my coffee, that's my coffee money, man. That's, that's my creamer. I'm supposed to give my $2 to a homeless person who didn't want to pull himself up by his bootstraps. And now I can't have coffee? That expression, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. What does that mean? How do you... You understand? We can't even give tiny little simple things. But our predecessors, the early church, they sold things that belonged to them. When you talk about possessions in the ancient world, you're talking about land. Come on. You're talking about houses. You're talking about horses and mules and sheep and probably not deer. But you're talking about things that are integral to your way of living and to your way of doing and to your way of being. And they were willing to sacrifice those things with nothing in here except love so that they could care for those among them who had less. We have to learn how to prioritize the kingdom in such a way that we're willing to give not only our physical possessions, not only our wealth, but our time and our energy and our heart and everything that we owe God anyways. On, when we start to look at the things that we have, our wealth, our possessions, we as Christians have to come to an understanding that these things don't belong to us now that we've declared that Jesus is our Lord. When someone is your Lord, what does that word Lord mean? It means somebody who has control over someone else's soul, over the souls of other peoples, over the lives of other peoples, over the land of other peoples. And you declare that Jesus is your Lord, but the things that belong to you, they're still yours. It, that's not scripture. That's not how that works. That's not how Christian living works. I'm not saying don't have nice things. I'm not saying don't have things. It might sound like that. But I'm saying don't hold your things so closely to you that when somebody else has a need that's greater than yours, you can't let them go. And, and let's talk about why. Let's move on to why now. Haggai chapter 1 verse 2 or verse, um, verse 6. Let's, let's finish off verse 5 again. Now the Lord of armies says this. Think carefully about your ways. Verse 6, you have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. You put clothes, you put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner, the worker, the minimum wage worker, the whoever worker, the big time worker, the worker puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. 
The Lord of armies says this, think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down lumber and build the house and I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You expected much, but then it amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, here's where it gets terrifying. God says, I ruined it. When you brought the harvest into your house, I ruined it. And God says, why? This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. Because my house still lies in ruins while each of you is busy with his own house. So on your account, the skies have withheld the dew and the land its crops. I have summoned a drought on the fields and the hills, on the grain, new wine, fresh wine, and whatever the ground yields on people and animals and on all that your hands produce. Okay, now, raise your hand with me if, just be honest, just be honest, just be honest. Raise your hand with me if on God's part, that doesn't seem a little bit extreme. Does that seem intense? Maybe not extreme, but intense. At least agree with me that that seems intense. That's intense, right? You haven't rebuilt my temple, and so I'm starving your animals to death. <laughs> All your peaches and apples, they grow with worms in them. You can't eat them. Your wine over ferments. I don't know how wine doesn't work. I don't know. <laughs> but you can't drink it. Nothing. Nothing that you do works. It's, it's kind of intense, right? And if, you, if, if at least you're on the outside and you look at that and you, see, you, you say, that's an angry God. They didn't rebuild his temple. And so he's that angry with them to the point that he's going to starve them and let them not eat and whatever and all that kind of stuff. And... And all these other things that we say because we don't understand or know the history of what's going on in the Bible. I told you 500 years before this, uh, Solomon built a temple that had God's physical presence in it, right? 500 years before that, Moses and the children of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness. 500 years or a thousand years? I don't know. But they were wandering around in the wilderness in 15... In 1500 BC, they were wandering around, around in the wilderness after God had delivered them from Egypt. Now we read Exodus chapter 24. We're not going to read it today, but Exodus chapter 24 is basically the preliminary part to God delivering the covenant to the children of Israel. And the Bible says that Moses read the entire covenant to the children of Israel. And in Exodus chapter 24, verse 3 and verse 7, the children of Israel the Bible says with one voice, with one voice, say, we will do all that the Lord commands. So they signed an agreement with God. They signed a perpetual agreement with God. What does perpetual mean? It means that they have to keep the agreement and their children have to keep the agreement and their children have to keep the agreement and they have to keep the agreement for as long as they keep having children. So they signed this agreement with God. And here's the thing about God. When we're faithful to what we're supposed to do with God, God is faithful to what he's supposed to do with us. And here's the thing about God. When we're not faithful with what we're supposed to do to God, God is faithful with what he's supposed to do for us. So part of this agreement is that they're supposed to represent God and they're supposed to be a peculiar people and they're supposed to be strange and they're supposed to look different by the way that they execute their culture. That's part of the agreement. The way that they execute culture is not the way that the rest of the world is supposed to ex execute culture. The way that they do things and the way that they operate is not the way the rest of the world is supposed to operate. Why? So that when they're operating in a way that's completely different from the rest of the world, it forces the world to pay a certain amount of attention on them and ask, why are they like that? And then they can respond, well, because of our God. Come on, how are you living your life? How are you living your life? You understand? So they were supposed to live their lives in such a way that attention was drawn to them and they would immediately be able to reflect that attention towards God. And the agreement between them and God was that if they did this, they would always have food and they would always have land and their children would always be warm and they would always be clothed. But God said, because I'm singling you out like this, I need you to understand that if you fail to uphold your end of the agreement, the nations still need to be able to see me through you. So if you don't uphold your end of the agreement and if you turn to other gods and you worship other gods, 
These are the terms and the stipulations and the conditions of the agreement with God that the people had. If you turn to other gods and you do things that you're not supposed to be doing according to our agreement, I'm going to give you over to the other nations and you're going to go hungry. You're going to go thirsty. You're going to go naked. You're going to go into slavery. Your children are going to be put to the sword. And God says, do you agree? And we say, I agree. And God says, all right then. We're in agreement. So by the time we get back here, they just came out of 70 years of God saying, well, you broke your end of the agreement, so there you go. But in the midst of the agreement, God says, despite all of that, I'll still always have mercy on you, and I will bring you back to your land. And so he brought them back to their land. That's what we're reading right now. He brought them back to their land. And the first thing that they did was fail to prioritize him. That'd be like the prodigal son coming back home and his father runs out to greet him and he just swerves his father and then goes inside the house and starts eating all the food. That's exactly what this is. They started building back their own houses. They started doing all these things and they didn't align themselves with the promise of God for their lives. And God is telling them, yeah, you're trying to build, but, and if you read this whole book, it's so amazing. It's only two chapters. But they're trying to build and they're not getting any progress. And they're trying to farm and they're, they're still not growing anything. But we're back in Israel. We're back in Judah. We're back in the land of promise. My, 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 my dad and my grandparents, they told me about how amazing this place was. They told me about what was going on here. What, why is it not happening for me? God, I see what you've done for others and I want that for myself. <laughs> I see what you've done for others, and I want that for myself. Okay, when God did that for others, were you there? When God was doing what he was doing for others, were you going through what they were going through? When God was doing what he was doing for others, were you giving up what they needed to give up in order to see the glory of God? When they were going hungry so that they could give, were you, were, were you, were you in there with them hungry? You understand what I mean? When they were taking the last meal that they had so that somebody else could have a meal, were you there with them? So these children of Israel, these children of Judah, they failed to align themselves with God. And therefore, nothing that they wanted to do for God worked. We're supposed to be people who represent God's kingdom and we're supposed to be people and it's not working. We're supposed to be the type of church that when people see us, they say, man, God is surely with those people. Maybe I should start going to church. But when people see me, and this is, this is Kareem talking now. When people see me, they see a guy who goes to the, the grocery store with his AirPods on. And I don't even have the possibility to talk to anybody because I'm too busy listening to music and ignoring the rest of the world and making sure that nobody touches me or rubs shoulders with me. When people see us, when people see the way that we do church, when people see the, see the way that we operate, it doesn't make them want to do this because they haven't aligned themselves with, because we haven't aligned ourselves with God. If we align ourselves with God and not in a way that satisfies us, and not in a way that makes us feel good, and not in a way that makes us feel good about how we're operating, behaving, and doing, and being, but in a way that pleases God according to what he's told us about how we're supposed to do things to represent him. If we do that, then we're going to see real fruit. And guess what? That fruit's not necessarily going to look like your pockets being filled, but it's going to look like the kingdom of God coming down on earth. I close with this chapter. James chapter 1 verse 27. James chapter 1 verse 27. Religion that God our Father accepts and as pure and faultless, in some translations it says, religion that is good to God, is this, to look after orphans and widows and in their distress and to keep, sorry, and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That last part, it's big. We leave it out, but it's big. 
So good religion is to look after people who can't take care of themselves. Good religion is to look after people who have been disenfranchised by the world. Good religion is to look after people who when you do something for them, you have to do it with a heart that says, I'm not going to get anything in return for this, but I do it anyways because it's the work of the kingdom. And in the midst of that, not letting yourself be stained by the power, the pressure of the world so that the next time you get an opportunity, you're not bitter about it, but you keep doing the work of the kingdom. I'm challenging every single one of us today especially in this season of giving. We talk about a season of giving. It's Christmas. It's a season of giving. And then we go out, we, we buy out the whole place so that we can give gifts to our friends and our family. People freeze to death in Toronto. Toronto, first world country. People an hour away from Belleville don't have clean drinking water. These are things that we don't think about because it doesn't matter to us. But I'm encouraging us to prioritize the kingdom, realign ourselves with God, and begin to navigate the way that we do community in such a way that we love our brothers and sisters in the church to the point that if we have to sell whatever we have so that they can be all right, get out of debt, make it one more month, we're willing to do that and do it with love and without bitterness. I'm challenging us to love our neighbors the way that we want to be loved. Jesus, when he was asked, what's the greatest command? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And the grammar that he uses when he says a second is like it is as if to say these two commands are the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and love your neighbor the way that you love yourself. You want to put that phrase in modern times, love your neighbor the way that you love yourself? It says the dignity that you want ascribed to you, ascribe that to others. Don't let people freeze to death in the cold in the same city that you live in. Don't let people starve to death. Don't let people have unclean water. There's so many resources that you can reach out to. There's so many things that you can tap into. And when you tap into those things, you can do the work of the kingdom, both inside your church and outside your church. Amen? All right, I'm done. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. I really want to uh, just pray real quick, if that's okay, sir. Um, yeah, God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Father, in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, thank you for the things that Jesus has done. Thank you for the ministry that Jesus carried out, Lord God. Thank you for the work that Jesus finished on the cross that made open and available and accessible the church, the people that he called out to be a community that when we see it, it reflects the love of God and draws people into God when they see his love. I pray, Father God, that you would teach us how to be people who prioritize the kingdom, that you would give us the grace and the awareness of self to reassess how we are aligned with ourselves and with you and with your kingdom and with your work and what we think and feel and believe about you. And I pray, Lord God, that in so doing, when we have a proper understanding of who God is and what the work of the kingdom is, that we will carry that understanding and that love out into our communities so that we can fulfill the work of Jesus, both spiritually and materially. Bless this church, Lord God. Thank you for letting me have the, the grace and the opportunity to stand here and be with them, Lord God. And I pray that as a church, we would reevaluate what it means to give and be willing to give even if it costs us and be willing to give, Lord God, even to those who could never possibly pay us back. The Lord be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.